Hello again, everybody. So today we're going to take a like a quick little break. We talked about the background of Luther and some of the early challengers to the church, guys that were having issues with it. Now I'm going to take a little bit of a different direction and talk about some other guys who were critical of the church, but we're looking to do it in a different way. And once again, we have our friend, humanism. You are tired of humanism at this point, but it just doesn't go away, so let's get into it. All right, so what is the deal here? So, what we have established is we've got some problems. The two main guys I'm going to talk about in this video, Desiderius Erasmus, fantastic name, and Thomas More, recognize the issues in the church. They recognize the lavish spending. They recognize the less than moral character. They recognize some of the other economic type issues, all right? And what they want to try to do is address these issues while at the same time preserving the church. They still believe in the Pope. They still believe in, in the religion as it stands, but they want to do something that can influence it, I guess you could say, in a positive manner. Um, and Luther knew who Erasmus was, too, and, and, and there was definitely some exchange there, but in the end, he felt that Erasmus just wasn't willing to go far enough. So, here we go. So, the first guy we're going to talk about, Desiderius Erasmus, again, a fantastic name. And look at him, he's just like, just chill. Um, so he is Dutch, he is from Holland, and he went to religious schools his whole life, so obviously uh, Catholicism played a very, very large role. Um, and he was really concerned. I mean, he was concerned about the breakdown, he was concerned also about these challengers uh, to the church, and, and he really felt that, I guess you could say, that the church had lost its way a bit, and so what can he do to, to, to bring it back? So his big first work was the Handbook of the Christian Knight, okay, um, in which he develops this concept and, and pushes forth this idea of the philosophy of Christ, okay. And there's a great, great quote from that that says, most Christians are superstitious rather than pious, and except for the name of Christ, differ hardly from all superstitious pagans. The idea here is that he really feels that people have strayed away from Jesus and, and that they believe in things like, you know, magic and superstition and stuff like that, and that he feels that we need to get back to the message of Jesus. And so what his big thing is, is that people should focus on Christianity itself, that Christianity is the guide in your life, that it's not necessarily the strictures of the church or the ceremonies and whatnot, but it is the message, okay? And, and so really for him, the focus would be on, say, the Gospels, um, and that someone's focus should be in piety and obeying Christ, Yes, going to Mass, and, and yes, praying and stuff like that, but, but really trying to follow the message of Jesus, uh, rather than like the sacraments, pilgrimages, or saints or relics, particularly saints or relics. He felt that, that people were getting a little bit too wrapped up into venerating saints and, and thinking like, you know, the finger bone of St. Anselm like could heal the sick or something. Like, he didn't like that. And in the end, it was all about simplicity. Focus on yourself. Don't worry about other people. Try to follow the ideas of Jesus. He also decided to translate uh, a Greek and a New Latin translation, translation of the Bible because he felt that there were definitely some errors there because he was a very learned man. So, you know, he also did that on the side. The big influencer, though, was his book called The Praise of Folly. Um, in The Praise of Folly, what he was trying to do was he criticized the current issues of the church in a kind of funny way. And so he used humor to point out some of the absurdities of, um, of what the, the clergy was doing and, and things along that line, okay? And he says, uh, "'Tis the part of a truly prudent man not to be wise beyond his condition, but either to take no notice of what the world does or run with it for company." So either someone is just going to ignore everything that's going around him, or he's going to run with the world and maybe actually try to do something about it. 
His ultimate goal is, again, to reform the church, but in a moderate way, okay? He doesn't challenge the Pope or anything like that, but I think really what he was trying to do was to get people back to the simple message and get the Pope and the clergy to address some of the major issues that were going on in the church, which would happen, but it would take a little while. The other guy who um, was going around the same time, actually, they lived very close times, actually, like, for instance, Erasmus lived from 1466 to 1536, and Thomas More lived from 1478 to 1535. So, um, and these guys were actually really good friends. I'll skip down. Uh, he became very close friends with Erasmus, and they wrote letters back and forth to each other and stuff. Um, just like Erasmus, he was really focused on Greek and Latin, which one would enable him to study the Bible more, and but two, just increasing his overall knowledge, which is what a lot of these guys did. Um, he had a bunch of different uh, government positions. One of the most important was the Lord Chancellor of England, which was basically like the second-hand man to the king, although that wouldn't work out well in the end. So he is most known for writing... Uh, a book known as Utopia, and Utopia is a place, um, and he would posit some ideas as to what an idealistic community would look like, and he actually, if you look on the, the cover, that's a reprint, but he designed it that it would be an island, um, that they would remove themselves from ev everywhere else, okay, um, so... What is this ideal community? And the ideal community is based on cooperation. Cooperation and reason replace power and fame. Okay, everything is based off communal ownership rather than private property. So the idea is if there was no private property, then we don't have to worry about stuff. Okay, and since there was communal ownership that everyone would work nine hours a day, he figured it out literally, he was very specific in what he thought would happen, and they were rewarded with what they needed from the community. So if you had a job, you know, shoeing horses, don't worry, the people that made the food would make sure you were fed. So it's kind of like an early socialist kind of a view here, um... But what was really important is, like, no longer are you working for money or greed, as he would put it. Um, you were working for the good of all, and you would actually have greater leisure time, which would lead people to more moral, richer, and more fulfilled lives. Okay. But he's okay, believe it or not, with having a king here. Now, granted, he was serving King Henry VIII at this point, and King Henry VIII wasn't a guy you really jumped around against, but... And we'll talk about him more later. But he believed in a strong central government, but it was a government that worked well together. And you can see his feelings on, on, uh, on money here. He goes, they wonder much to hear that gold, which in itself is so useless a thing, should be everywhere so much esteemed that even men for whom it was made and by whom it has value should yet be thought of less value than it is. And that's the idea. Like, we think that, like, gold is more valuable than people or things, and inherently it's only valuable because we said it was valuable. And, and he was right back then. You know, you don't have electricity, which gold is really good at using. So, you know, the idea is that it's really inherently a worthless metal. Now, we're talking about Reformation stuff, though. Now, that's good philosophical view, but how does it work in religion? Well, this is very interesting here. Um, he's not a big fan of the priesthood sometimes. I have that quote up top, which I think is very interesting. Um, there is a great lazy gang of priests and so-called religious men. So he's not a super fun guy when it comes to... Uh, that. Now, it's very interesting between himself and, you know, others. Uh, Utopia preaches ultimate toleration. And let's look at this quote here. It goes, There are several sorts of religions, not only in different parts of the island, but in every town, some worshipping the sun, others the moon, or one of the planets. They differ in this, that one thinks... Um, th it should be they, or I think it says the, the go, whom he worships is this supreme being. And another thinks that his idol is that God. But they all agree in one principle, that whoever is the supreme being, he is also that great essence to whose glory and majesty all honors are ascribed by the consent of all nations. So what he's trying to say is like he's looking at all these religions that are present, the pagan religions and all that type of stuff, because England, you know, you know, had some pagans up there. And, you know, they all believe in, in some creator. And, and he felt that, 
there's nothing wrong with that. And that religion should practice in the same building, and you would have different sections. And, and he had a lot of stress that priests should be of the highest moral character and that they should work really hard for this. Um, although he is devoutly against atheism, he felt that atheism was, you know, basically a sin because he is a hardcore Catholic here. Which is really interesting, though, because he's a hardcore Catholic, um, and his, his views get get twisted a little bit. Um, when the Reformation starts to hit England, and you get guys like John Wycliffe and other, he hates this. He actually wants to persecute Protestants, and he's not a fan of people trying to break from the Catholic Church. It was very, very weird. Um... Unfortunately, because of his advocacies of strict Catholicism, that put him at odds with Henry VIII, uh, who was the king, uh, and eventually he ran afoul of Thomas because Thomas would not do what he wanted him to do. We will discuss this later. And eventually, because he crossed the king, Thomas More would be executed in 1535, although later on he would become a saint. Up here is the trial of Thomas More. But what we can see here is that despite his ultra-Catholicism and his in sometimes hatred of other religions, he yet still advocated it. And so we have these guys who are not really calling for the overthrow of religion, but rather are calling for a, a change, if you will, into religion, and that we need to look at the way things are structured a little bit differently. And they would have a lot of influence, and they would they would influence a lot of people, particularly other than the others in the Catholic Church, and we'll see the Catholic Church will respond a bit as well, okay? So make sure you've done your assignment with this, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you about it soon.